saved. Saved, the word implies, because it's past tense, that we are saved from something, from a something, which is something that it's a separation from our natural life now and a separation from our supernatural eternal life from Christ. So saved implies we're saved from something that keeps us away from Jesus Christ. So not rocket science when it comes to this topic and this verbiage that evangelical Christians usually used, usually use. But what if there is more? Saved means what? What if saved means saved from, but also saved for? Welcome to Chew On This, where we practice theology as a community in the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night church, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. This is Pastor Orlean Hasseltine, along with Pastor Robin Bjornsson and our lovely producer, Terry Hodges. And we all thank you so much for joining us for this week's discussion on Chew on This. This discussion was held live Wednesday night, July 31st, 2024, and there goes summer. Mm. And we are finishing up and wrapping up our series on Saved Means What? Week 13, Saved for Community. Let you know you can access all of the sermon notes on our website at realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night. Before we started recording, Pastor Robin and I were having a lovely conversation on this topic has been, as long as we've known each other, we've had classes, sessions, studies on salvation. What does it really mean? And picking it apart so we really understand the beauty and the magnitude of what it means. If you have listened to this entire series, you get it. It's like hitting your, yourself over the head with a marshmallow, continuing pounding it on your head. Mm-hmm. And I use marshmallow so you understand the reference of just being, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm a numbskull, I don't get this. Because in its simplicity, we miss the beauty of it and the mm, simplicity, we miss the the, what would the word be? Not complication, but we miss the entire definition yeah. of salvation, the completeness of it, yeah. and its simplicity. The we can miss mm-hmm. the richness and the completion of it. So we have, and all of this time, coming to this statement of saved from, got that, but saved for has never hit me over the head like it has now. Right. This idea there is a saved for. Yes. And it's not just heaven. Right. It reminds me, Pastor O, of, you know, when we're when we're little and we get an opportunity to play with paints, you know, watercolor paints. Yes. And that's completely appropriate for that stage of development. Yes. What Michelangelo did at the Sistine <laughs> Chapel is a completely different expression, more full, more rich of that same idea. And that's what this exploration of salvation um, has done for me. Yeah. Michelangelo. So now I'm going to have to get a new piece of art to put in my office that represents, <laughs> right? We right. keep running into these All amazing these art, forms. art mm-hmm. yeah, the artistic expression of scripture and mm-hmm. the whole experience of relationship with Christ. So we're looking at here, we have been through repentance, faith, conversion, God's grace, all of these things that atonement, justification, regeneration, I'm not doing them in order, adoption, sanctification, and perseverance, the long obedience, all of this amazing encouragement and wrapping ourselves up with the embrace of Christ, understanding what really happened when we fell in love with Jesus and the natural and supernatural things that we can actually look at and define. And now we're here. It's like, yay, I am saved. We can sing Bob Dylan's song. I am saved. I am so glad, da, 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 all that kind of stuff. And yes, Bob Dylan really does have a song like that. He has an amazing, I think he has three three albums that deal with his belief in Christ. Wow. And they're amazing, if you like his music. <laughs> and not everybody has heard it. And there are some youth we have introduced to it who thought we were joking them because they didn't think anybody could make money with a voice like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh, you so, you so need to go start at the beginning mm-hmm. and follow and see who this gentleman is. Anyway, <laughs> looking at saved, saved from, all of us can wrap our head around. If you've heard this terminology, whether or not you've embraced it in your life or not, you get the idea that you're saved from hell so you can go to heaven and live with Jesus in eternity. And I say it that way not to make fun of it, but to make fun of us. Because that is 
the end result, but there's this journey in this relationship, and there's a lot that happens here on this planet. There is this amazing experience of saved, but we all get that saved for a relationship with Christ, um, saved so we can saved from, so we can you know be in heaven with Him and all of this. But then we kind of stop there. But there's a whole lot more, like a whole New Testament more, and that's what I want to talk about in this final podcast dealing with this conversation on saved means what. We're going to start with looking at Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And yes, I'm going to be reading all 10 verses. And I will do my very best to read it in an interesting manner. <laughs> because this is defining the community with Christ. When we talk about being with Christ, this is a, a really good scriptural definition. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and I'll be reading in the Common English Bible version. At one time, you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. You used to live like the people of this world. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. Got that? At one time, you were like those persons. All of you used to do whatever felt good and whatever you thought you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everyone else. However, verse 4, God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. He did this because of the great love that he has for us. You are saved by God's grace. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us in heaven with Christ. God did this to show the future generations the greatness of his grace by the goodness that God has shown us in Christ Jesus. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. Instead, we are God's accomplishments created in Christ Jesus to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. Make sure I got it all. And I did. There we go. It is done. Here it is. Defining the community with Christ. Paul, as he's writing to the church at Ephesus, which is a very central, powerful church at the time, encouraging and def and embracing and giving direction and helping them understand exactly what is happening in the supernatural and the natural world mix, which we now call theology, and just figuring out how that goes together. And there's three specific things that he listed that God has done for us. But he already did them for Christ, but he's doing them for us as well, because we are the inheritors of what Christ has done. But to explain them, According to P.J. Riken in his book, The Message of Salvation, by God's grace for God's glory, there is this, Paul is a really intelligent and really creative, and I just love this because he says that Paul virtually invents three new words by adding the preposition with to three standard Greek verbs, things that people knew, but he switched them up and made it more interesting and actually attacked our brain so we would look at it differently. So the original here is reading this and go, what? What was that? Well, I've never heard that before. There would be that reaction to hearing this read to you. And the first one is in verse 5. God made us alive with Christ. And the Greek word starts with an S and a Y, and it has the word zoo in the middle, and then a P-O-I-E-O, E-I-E-I-O. -E so <laughs> there, God, I, I know. Love I love it. Greek is amazing. And I need someone to help me. That's why we have books. So mm -hmm. there we go. God made us alive with Christ. First word he made up. The second one is he raised us up with Christ. And that Greek word looks like synergy. So he made us alive with Christ. He raised us up with Christ. And then he seated us with him. And that Greek word looks like syntax or synthesio. There's an amazing. So these three new words refer to three things that we already understand if we read our Bible and have been. There's three words that we already have heard and, and try to understand. I'll put it that way. The first one, he made us alive with Christ, is referring to the resurrection. The second one, he raised us up, raised us up with Christ, is referring to Christ's ascension and our future ascension. And then and he seated us with him is referring to Christ's session or his reign. So the original hearers are going, what are you talking about, Paul? This idea that we're going to be resurrected and we're going to be living, we're going to ascend and live where Christ is and live with him there and that we're going to reign with him, that we're going to be part of. So what Christ did and he earned, he's going to let us live in that aftermath, that glory of it, that he's even sharing that with us. 
Is that what he means? So let's pick apart these three things as we start with the first half of the podcast. We're going to be looking at this, defining the community with Christ. And then we're going to answer a question that comes from this in the second half of today's podcast. The very first thing, God made us alive with Christ, the resurrection. Did you know that in Greek, (laughs) Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is one beautiful, complicated, unusual extremely normal for Paul run on sentence. It's one just great big so you gotta you you gotta read it without taking a breath. We put periods in there but he's not and I, I see the I see the the dude I see Paul stating this as who's ever scribing it for him and he's going and they're like uh 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 well you know as you're trying to because mm-hmm. they are writing and they don't want to make an error because quote unquote paper or papyrus is expensive Mm -hmm. whatever they're writing it on and it could be leather it could be what that is very expensive Mm -hmm. so they don't want to make any mistakes it's like don't go so fast but it's one great big beautiful long sentence so here in Acts 13 we're going to get a connection to with Christ in Acts 13 verses 34 through 41 it's talking about God making Jesus alive. So God raised Jesus from the dead, never again to be subjected to death's decay. It says that in verse 34 and then in verse 37. But the one whom God has raised up didn't experience death's decay. Because even though David talked about this in the Old Testament, he died. He did not Resur- he was not resurrected at that time, so he experienced decay, but Christ is the only one, so he has to be talking about Christ in these verses in the Old Testament. Therefore, brothers and sisters, know this. Through Jesus, we proclaim forgiveness of sins to you. From all those sins from which you couldn't be put in a right relationship with God through Moses' law. You can't earn this stuff, but through Jesus, everyone who believes is put in right relationship with God. So when we take that verse and we bounce back into Ephesians, we discover that here Acts is talking about Jesus' resurrection and that it's applicable to us. And so Paul is telling us that this, this resurrection is something we can expect. Whatever spiritual life we have now flows from Jesus Christ because God made us alive together with Christ. We also are going to be resurrected like him. It is a great hope that we can have. Romans 6, 4 through 5 says this, and this is a wonderful connection. Therefore, we were buried together with him through baptism into his death. So when we get baptized as a a physical thing we do here on this planet, because Jesus tells us to do two things. He tells us to get baptized, and he tells us to practice communion. Those two things. And this is why. When we are buried together with Christ through baptism into his death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too can walk in newness of life. We are doing that as an outward sign of a future experience. We are going to be resurrected and matched with our human bodies just like he was at the end of time. If we were united together in a death like his, we will also be united together in a resurrection like this. And then Colossians 2.12 says the same, the same thing. So there is this, I want you to be baptized as a public witness. This applies to every person who falls in love with Jesus. Here in America, we don't take it anywhere near as seriously as other cultures, especially cultures where Christianity isn't something public, Mm -hmm. that this is something that you do Mm -hmm. because it is risky, it is defining, and it separates you from a lot of the rest of the culture Mm -hmm. because it is a public declaration, and it's good for us, and it defines community. It defines who is part of Jesus' family and who is not. Mm -hmm. So because we do that... And because it's so easy in America to do that, that we miss the cost of it. It's like we are going to be resurrected with them because we are practicing living dead here on this planet. Mm -hmm. So we have that one, the resurrection. And then Paul goes on to say with this synergy real word that he raises us up with Christ. Now, like it's done. He he's saying these in final terms. He's saying we are going to be resurrected. It's done! Exclamation point. We're going to be ascended with him. It's done! Exclamation point. And in Luke twenty four fifty and fifty three, he Luke states it this way: He led them out as far as Bethany, where he lifted his hands and blessed them. In verse 
51, as he blessed them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. So they got to watch. They worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem, overwhelmed with joy. And they were continuously in the temple praising God. So they're still practicing how they, they did faith. They're Jewish believers. There's all of this. They had the opportunity to see Jesus resurrected when he was in his resurrected form with his human body matched back to him, whatever we call that. I'm sure there's a fun theological word for that. But so he is this individual and they extra biblical sources say it was about 40 days that he lived with them in that state and about 500 of his disciples seen this. So they knew nobody could nobody could tell him it didn't happen because they knew and they watched it. So now Paul is saying, you know how you did that? That's us. He's not doing anything that we can't do through his power. It's not that we do it, that we have access to because of him. That's a better way of stating it. Mm -hmm. And so there was this lovely, all right, we are looking at it from such a distance and from such a different culture and from such a different price paid to be able to form these words that it's hard to, okay, so I get to go to heaven. I I get to ascend with him. I'm not just going to have a resurrection. I get to ascend and be with him. I get to go. There is this process. And and in Acts 1, 1 through 11, it it talks about this whole process. It, It gives it more in detail that while they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So they're looking up and they're seeing, they're okay, it wasn't like zip. This is my imagination. Mm-hmm. They're there. They've spent all this time with them. They're having these conversations. They're up there. They realize that it's coming to, there was a period of 40 days, it says right here in Acts 1, that he was speaking to them about God's kingdom. So they are seeing the supernatural crazy experience happening over a month in their eyes. They're seeing him walk through walls. They're seeing him eat things. They're seeing him talk to them, to reason with them. It is just weird. And he, he looks the same, but he doesn't look the same. So there's some supernatural things. I don't know, did he glow like Moses did back? I mean, who, who knows what's going on, right? So when it says in verse 9, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. So they are experiencing this and then they're watching him. And it's almost like you have to be in a supernatural stupor. This is all going on. You've heard all of this stuff (laughs) for about three years, maybe a year and a half, maybe six months. I don't know. When did you ever fall in love with Christ and this whole group of people that are part of this? And Paul blatantly states in Ephesians 2, 4, and 6 that we're included in that. That's not just Jesus' ascension. That's ours. So what? what, what did the, how did they understand that? Because they, they knew that. They, they were there. It's like, well, that's Jesus' stuff. Mm-mm, Paul's saying, no, 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 no. It's all new. This is yours. There is this, when we're talking inheriting everything, the idea of baptism, the reason why he does that is so we get it in our dense heads that we are supernatural beings having this temporary physical experience and all this stuff that mixes the two that Jesus took authority over, that's ours. It reminds me, Pastor O, of, um, you know, uh, as a child in my parents' home, it was my parents' home. They worked hard for what they got, but it was mine while I lived there. You know, as we have had kids, we had our home. We we worked hard for the different things that were there. And while our children were living in our home, they had access to all of that stuff as theirs, in a sense. Yes. It was yes. like we made a way for them to enjoy and live in things that they had not yet that they had not earned, but they got the privilege of functioning and living in while they were in our home. And and that's where this fits in my head for. It's like, Mm -hmm. of course we didn't earn this. We we couldn't do that. But look at what he made a way for us to live in. Hmm. I can open that door. I can dig in that drawer. I can go in that kitchen. Mm -hmm. I can open that fridge and, you know, make myself a snack. Look, Mom and Dad bought Fruit Loops. I can have Fruit Loops. (laughs) (laughs) No, Dad may have, but Mom sure did it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And then not only is he talking about that he made us alive with Christ, the word that has the zoo in the middle of it, (laughs) the resurrection, that he raised us up with Christ, the ascension. He's also going far as to say that he seated us with him, that he seated us so we can reign with him. And that's like, well, wait a minute. That That's an invitation to power and authority. That is, mm-hmm. this is kind of a crazy, there's a place of authority 
like the court is now in session, there is this word in this phrase, the session, which means to sit in a place of authority. So Christ was put into this place of authority. And that is something that we can be part of. It is done, Paul is saying. This has already happened. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23 says this. God's power was at work in Christ when God raised him from the dead and sat him at God's right side in the heavens. Far above every ruler and authority and power and angelic power, any power that might be named not only now but in the future. God put everything under Christ's feet and made him head of everything in the church which is his body. His body, the church, is the fullness of Christ who fills everything in every way. We are the exclamation point after Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. We are. We're part of that. He did this, and we're this exclamation point. That's right. Yes, um, mm-hmm. That is it. That you know, So we can walk around realizing we're just a tall, fleshly exclamation point running around saying, yeah, mm-hmm. Jesus Look at me. This is what he did. Jesus, mm-hmm. it's done. It's amazing. Uh-huh. It reminds me, Pastor O, of, you know, this concept of reigning and functioning in power. Mm-hmm. So if a parent teaches a child how to drive the family tractor. Yes. Then says, will you please go plow that field? Yes. And they now have training and they have the authority and then they go out and plow the field. It's kind of like what we get to do with Christ. And it's interesting because Paul, in his verbiage, he put what is called a a perfect tense verb. You have been made alive. You have been. You have been. This thing talks about a past event with a present consequence. So when you look at it, I mean, Greek is amazing. I know so little. But as you study, you run into these things. And it is amazing. I am not anywhere near, near being a Greek theologian, but I do love them, how they explain, and you get your head, okay, so if I was the original listeners, and I understood this, now I'm, 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 I'm getting to wrap my head around it more, because I'm understanding what's going on here, I would have understood past tense, present implication, not just reference, it, it applies to me, it's a, a for now, get on that tractor, but you know what, there's more, there's more to this story, this is just the beginning of this, there's more to this, so... Here in Acts 2, 32 through 37, we see what Paul was talking about there in Ephesians. We see where and how it starts showing up. So that's all of ours, but what do we do with it? Well, here's an example of how that works. In Acts 2, 32 through 37, Peter is preaching the very first sermon. Of all the stuff that Jesus dumped into him, he, he had the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He has the Holy Spirit residing inside of him like Jesus did, and now he's, he's stepping out and doing what Jesus trained him to do. And he is having this sermon going on, talking to all of these people that are in Jerusalem for the Passover, I believe, yes, the Passover, and the there's, oh, what did I read? So they're, they're thinking there's five to 6,000 people here listening to the sermon from where he was, and 3,000 of them respond immediately after he's done with this Holy Spirit-inspired sermon. We're picking it up here in verse 32, and this is Peter saying, This Jesus God raised up, we are all witnesses to that fact. He was exalted to God's right side and received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. He poured out the Spirit, and you are seeing and hearing the results of having done so. David didn't ascend into heaven, yet he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right side until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, listed in Psalm 110. Therefore, let all Israel know beyond question that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That is the Messiah. Here's all of the connector things. Peter's telling them all of this. When the crowd heard this, they were deeply troubled. So I wonder if there was a hush in my brain, the imagination. There's this like, and then they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, brothers, what should we do? They are beginning to understand that we are saved from should naturally bring about this next question. What are we saved for? What are we saved for? So if you continue reading into Acts 2, you're going to see the natural outcome of this conversation and of that question. Here in verse 42, it states, The believers devoted themselves to, number one, the apostles' teaching, number two, to the community, number three, to their shared meals, and number four, to their prayers. 
And it says a sense of awe overcame everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. Christianity is not a life alone. It is a life together. That is quoting P.G. Riken. It is not a life alone. It is definitely a life together. There is no such thing as private Christianity, he also says. So here I'm coming with this question. So the Christian life is personal, but is it private? How public is it? Baptism. Baptism in and of itself. Very personal. But it's definitely not private. Communion. Oh, extremely personal, celebrating his love for us and what he did, the price he paid so we could have it. But it's definitely not private. These are public things. So as I'm thinking about this, it's like, you know, sin can compromise or sin does not can. It compromises what we're created to be, including who we're created to be as a community. It just compromises all of that. Baptism, Jesus is talking about it in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, and he commands us to baptize everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. So there's a, an amazing, there's baptism. And then in communion, Paul outlines it in 1 Corinthians 11, to every time we eat and drink, eat this bread and drink this cl- cup, we broadcast the death of our Lord Jesus until he comes. So there is this declaration of come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, what our church is named after that statement. Maranatha, Maranatha, we're declaring that he's coming back. Jesus speaks community when he speaks the plan of salvation. He uses plural verbiage, them, us, we. It's never I, me, myself. Jesus, he speaks, Paul speaks community when he writes. It is an us experience. We are saved from sin and saved from a life separate from Christ in eternity, but we are saved for community. You can't get around it. Back to Acts 2, 42. The believers devoted themselves to these four things, and it reads interesting in the Common English Bible version, the apostles' teaching to the community. Kind of get those, but to their shared meals. Are you telling me, Pastor O, that everybody lived in a commune and your head is starting to go cult, cult? It's like, no, they did live communal. And then they were also devoted to their prayers. But we have to wrap this around the patriarchal model, Pastor Robin, that you studied and, and trained us on, I don't know how many series ago, so well. And that there was this, the patriarch of a clan would have the right to keep children, keep your children if you decide to go live outside of the clan rules. The, their authority was that entrenched and that strong. And it did keep them safe and help society grow at the time. But here, if you're in this clan and they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah and you decide to choose that, you have nothing. You do not have a job. You do not have any social security. You do not have any access to medical things because the clan takes care of all of that for you. Mm-hmm. It is part of what your your so, what your fam, family structure is it's it's wrapped around a family structure and it and it worked to a certain extent but now here if you don't have the same faith as that clan you are dead to them you need to go somewhere and have a place so here they're having people show up who have made this decision and their their family has they're they're dead to their family yeah. and in our culture and in our time we are so independent and and we take care quote unquote, we think we do, but you always need other people, but we take care of ourselves. It's really hard to understand what the decision cost individuals and not quite sure what was going to happen. And then watching, well, a new clan is being born. A new community is being formed. Mm -hmm. And this is what it took for that to happen. Nobody was forced to do anything. You can look up Ananias and Sapphira and see what happened in their crazy decision to lie about stuff. Mm -hmm. But no one is asked to do anything. People Mm -hmm. make a free decision led by the Holy Spirit in their own conscience what to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I happen to have two homes. So this one I will open up for people to use as a transient shelter until they can figure out, and we will figure out how all of this works. Well, you know, I own this business, and I could hire this person. I mean, all of those types of in, those that type of thinking went into this this statement that they they took care of one another as a community. So they devoted themselves to these things, these four things. So devotion, what an amazing, beautiful word. I mean, there's songs written about it, poetry wrapped around this, and what in the world does it really mean? It's actually an adjective, and 
devoted is an adjective because it's a, a, a noun that has been modified. It means very loving or loyal. But then we look at all the other definitions here. Faithful, true. If I had to take a devoted test, all right, these are the things that I get to test on. How am I with very loving, loyal, faithful, true, staunch, I like that word, but it has negative connotations in my brain, steadfast, constant, committed, dedicated, devout, loving, affectionate, devotion, strong love, affection, or dedication. So how devoted am I to my faith? to the Bible and all the things that are part of Christian living. Am I Olympic level? Since we're watching the Olympics, by the way, did you see the women's rugby team? I oh, did. The oh, last time. run. Oh, oh yeah. my goodness. Yes. Uh, our daughter, Samantha, who played rugby in college, and I asked her, and she's like, this is the year we're trying to watch him. And she, I could just see her screaming at the end because it wasn't going to happen, and mm -hmm, then it did. Mm -hmm. Yes, just watching that intensity when they interviewed the team. Do I have that kind of dedication and intensity in the way I live my Christian life? Teaching of the apostles they were devoted to. They were devoted to the fellowship of the community. They were devoted to the breaking of bread or communion. And they were also devoted to the prayers, which we would interpret as worship. So what is the teaching of the apostles? Note that Luke did not write here. No, yes, Luke did not write here in Acts that they were devoted to teaching, period. Luke, being very well educated, knew differently. They were devoted to the teaching of the apostles. All right. So does that mean then, Pastor Robin, that I can go online and find myself an apostle and be devoted to that one person? And there, I fulfilled that check mark. I'm going to go see Jesus. He's going to say, way to go. You were devoted to the teaching of an apostle. No, that's mm -hmm. not what it's meaning. It is talking about scripture. They were devoted because now we have all that teaching. All the stuff they did has been written down and left for us. All right. So then I can go online and I can be devoted to the teaching of an apostle or a prophet online who reads the Bible to me and explains it to me. Check mark. No, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. It is talking about that teaching in a community. So you can see that teacher live it out right you can practice it yourself and have people say hey what'd you do that for or hey wait a minute don't get upset over that or hey let me stand beside you as we walk through this this is a big learning curve hey let me explain this to you more fully there is the teaching of the apostles what we have in scripture and it's done in community and community surprise 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 social media does not create community mm -mm. it creates attention false intimacy yeah but mm -hmm. it is not community community mm -hmm. the are people that can come up and see you in your everyday and respond to it community is where you get to be around people in their everyday and respond to it so taking what they taught and see if it really works that's what this original exclamation is talking about that is how the community of the church started putting it into practice how to care for one another how to worship God how to share the faith Faith, the things about studying the Bible and how it gives us definition and then seeing it lived out by others and seeing what it, if it really works. You just don't put it in your head. It has to go into practice and practice has to happen around other people so they can reflect it back to you. Mm -hmm. This devoted themselves, that phrase they're devoted is a dedication, a dedication to this very specific, like the word keen, they were just keen for something, hard for something, for the word translated devoted suggests almost a preoccupation with hearing and studying apostolic doctrine. This preoccupation, they want to hear it, they want to study it, and when you study something, you put it into practice. There is this idea of, the word is pro blah, blah, blah. it's a long one and it's beautiful, <laughs> and Proscart something, and they were just intense. There's this intense excitement, like going on vacation, or I'm gonna have this adventure, I'm gonna have a baby. All these, oh yeah, I'm going for my husband motorcycle trip. I don't care where I'm on my motorcycle. This keen anticipation. So, do I have that? Maybe I did when I first fell in love with Jesus, but where did it go? Is it, is it there? What does it look like after you've loved Jesus for an extremely long time, for decades, right? So signs of devotion to teaching of the apostles. You can't just be devoted to teaching, but the teaching of the apostles, the teaching of scripture. 
you are not claiming community from just an online group. You cannot do it. There's no such thing. It can be in addition to, but you have to walk every day. People have to see you get hurt, get mad, recover, invest in, try, fail, try, succeed, see you grow, support you, help help you get where you need to be. They need to see it all. This is the process of seeing your scriptures alive in you. We don't like it because it's too transparent. Mm-hmm. But that is what scripture is talking about, community. It is not living in the same house unless God tells that you to do. We've had people live with us before because of that God asking us. We knew personally that was going to happen. So there is this idea of doing community or following a person or prophet who has no proven community. That's not what they're talking about. It's a scholarly process. It's not just what they think it means. You can go back and prove it, which is one of the beautiful things we really enjoy around here is working our hardest to make it theologically accurate. Thank you, Christians, for biblical equality. Mm -hmm. And it must involve the voice of other godly teachers, proven teachers, whose life matches what they say. Because you can say whatever you want online. It doesn't mean it's true. Surprise, surprise, surprise. And it involves study. Mm -hmm. You don't get to outsource your theology. Mm -hmm. Taking that quote from Taryn Williams, Mm -hmm. you don't get to do that. And then we get to do what it says. We get to practice it. So this idea of being devoted to that, am I devoted to that transparent process of living around others who are going the same direction? A long obedience in the same direction and doing it together. They were committed to that. That's what happened when they met Jesus. There was this saved for. That was one of the things they did. The next thing they did is they were devoted to fellowship or devoted to that community. The word for fellowship is kinonia. And it comes from this word koinias. Koinos, koinos, which means common. Common, I guess that's where community comes from. It means common. Bears witness to the common life of the church in two ways. One, that we share in it together. It expresses that we share in this life together. So I'm not making this stuff up. This idea of fellowship and community, we are in it together. Also, we are in it together like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are in it together. So when Paul is writing these things that we are with Christ, we are experiencing the things Christ is experiencing within the Godhead. These are ours. We are part of that reflection. So when we live this way as a community of Christ, we are a reflection of the Trinity. You can't help it. Mm -hmm. And so I ask myself, huh, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, Father. I'm not sure what kind of reflection that was. This idea, we are reflecting that Trinitarian community. Mm -hmm. So it is a koinonia is a Trinitarian experience. It's our common share in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It is a common share. I like that phrase. Mm -hmm. So this Jesus in me fellowships with the Jesus in you. So that's one of the things that we we find in this expression of koinonia. The second thing, it is expresses that we share out together, that we give out what we receive. We offer to others what Jesus offered to us. Oh, that's witnessing, right? Well, it is witnessing, but you do it in your lifestyle. You can do it with your words, but you do it in your lifestyle. When we read through this stuff in Acts, one of the things that we realize is generosity is something that is part of the the Godhead. Jesus has done all this and he gives us all of the after effects of it. So we see that as something that is there. But we share out together. We also um, create safety. We also um, celebrate, celebration. We also play. All of these different things that are done in community, this is part of koinonia, making it an expression of our faith. Nobody can give you your community. I can't give you my community. You can't give me yours. You invest and you receive. If you're not present and you don't do the hard work, nobody. you can't get mad. And I tell you what, people are going to annoy you and you're going to get hurt and you're going to think they're wrong. And it's your decision to stay or go. But you show up and you do. Mm-hmm. You show up and you do. In my summation, you go to church where Jesus asks you to go and you stay there till he asks you to leave. Right. And that means you're a mature enough Christian to hear him speak to you. Right. So the sharing was never demanded, just like in our life now, that you, sh- you shared, you did what Christ asked you to do. And you can have people who are mature Christians echo that if you have never done that before. When you realize he's asking you to do something you've never done before. Mm-hmm. So what are signs I'm devoted to fellowship or I'm devoted to community? Number one, do I invest in it? Am I present? Receiving from it is one thing. But do I invest back? Because if I don't invest back, I'm definitely not devoted. Am I available? Do I show up? Not just do, but do I actually show up? And am I generous? These are things that I would list as a signs of being devoted to fellowship, being devoted to community. And then 
it goes on to say, the breaking of the bread, which is communi- communi- communion, and devoted to prayer, which is worship. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Their fellowship was expressed not only in caring for each other. I'm quoting um, Stott in his Message of Acts commentary. The breaking of bread and prayers. Okay, back up. Caring for each other, but in corporate worship too. Moreover, the definite article in both express literally the breaking of the bread and the prayers. Suggestive reference to the Lord's Supper on one hand, although almost certainly at this early stage of the church that was part of a larger meal, so it was potluck or something. It was a great big meal had together. And what happens when you eat together? And prayer services are regular worship meetings, not just private prayer. So when we read this here in Acts, there was this natural, we're going to have communion. And we know because of the instructions in Corinthians about communion, that there was usually a supper attached to it. And by the time Paul got to writing that letter, there were some weird things happening. And he was trying to reconstruct it for them to go back to this original intent of what it was like to share the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, and what it meant to do that. So there is, start writing about this, that it is a community experience. It isn't something that is done alone. It is done together. It And this situation and this understanding, it took time. It had to take, I can't imagine how many hours to have dinner like that and then follow it up with this worship service of this is what Christ told us to do. We're going to reflect on the price that he paid on his blood, on his the cost that he paid at, at on the cross, all of this. We're going to look at that. So this had to take three hours hmm. or more. I mean, there was this, and it turned into this wonderful worship service. So threading and braiding these things together was extremely easy as people were hearing this read to them. It's like, all right, so this is this is exactly what happened. Yep, that's that was happened there. That's what we were told. So there as we read this here in Acts, as is being written down here by Luke, that Paul understood that and he was reflecting back to that. So here these original readers reading this stuff in Ephesus, they're getting an idea of what Paul is talking about when they were devoted to things and what actually happened. So here in Acts to the community of believers, going back to something I read earlier in the podcast, because we are in the second part and we're heading towards wrapping up today's podcast. So, Pastor Aline, my brain's a little fuzzy. You seem to be bouncing back and forth, and you, you bet I am. There isn't a whole great big structure of points here, except we are saved for community. You cannot, you cannot deny that. There is, <laughs> there is this falling in love with Jesus in the 80s and, the, and witnessing was such a, a big focus and this idea of going out and witnessing on the street and a lot of the Christian uh, musicians in their artistic format were talking about witnessing all the time and but witnessing is connected to love but you have to verbally say and you, you, you keep track of who you witnessed to that day and you can feel really good about that notch in your belt and then if somebody actually prays the, the, the salvation prayer with you, I mean there was a structure to it and I get it. I understand why we do that, but I also understand why we should not make it such a structure. Because when you read here, the community of believers in Acts chapter 2, there was this natural thing that happened. And once again, looking at 42 through 47, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the community, to their shared meals, which is communion, and to their prayers, which is worship. So once again... Scriptural learning in a community that can give you feedback and you can give feedback to a committed community, all right? And then there is having communion together. Okay, then there's having a worship time together. And then there's plain old fellowship, just being together. They did this over and over and over, not because they were witnessing They did it because they needed to survive as individuals who have now made a life change. We don't have that pressure to survive, to hang on crazily to one another. So we can get ticked off and leave anytime we want and go to our own home and pout. But when they don't do that, when they are committed, okay, Jesus, help me do this. Help me be part of this. Help me be a a contributing factor in this community. It says a sense of awe came over everyone. 
God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. Well, Pastor Orlean, if I seen signs and wonders, I would believe, too. I would be part of that community. Well, you're not going to see them if you're not there. You don't get to hear about them or be part of. Mm-hmm. And we can't. I mean, it is amazing when people are healed of something big, but they're also healed of things that are small. There's amazing, beautiful things when someone who was who, who lost the ability to trust individuals because of trauma in their past learn how to trust. Right. So you're not going to see those. Well, and I see this working naturally and organically in our life. You know, this is our getting together and talking about the sermon that was preached on yep. Sunday yep. or Wednesday. And what did you think about that? What point really stirred your brain and how did that work for you? And chewing that over and discussing that together and in the conversation over a meal, how it naturally flows into what's going on in your life and how this applies to your life, which flows right into, let's just, let, let's pray about that. Mm-hmm. And, yes. you know, I mean, so you can see just the, the natural move movement of gathering together. We used to call it just fellowship, right? Right. But it's talking about this teaching together and digesting it and pulling it apart. How does it apply while we eat? And I've watched that over and over and over again, move right into, oh, let's pray together. Let's, Mm -hmm. let's, and who knows what will happen out of that, that closeness with the Lord, the movement of the Holy Spirit, healings in different forms. I mean, this doesn't have, this isn't a stained glass process. Correct. Yes. And the organicness of it, you don't have to have this. What you have to have is a structure. We need to show up and care. Yeah. And then the personal relationships that develop out of those things. Mm-hmm. Let, let's do that. And it is fun to watch when you volunteer in different departments. You start meeting people and you, and you date. You mm-hmm. date your people to see if they'll be good friendships. And to look, oh, okay, we have the same hobby interest. So that you go and you, you find. So all of these different experiences. So they shared everything. They were united. They had meals together. And then it says, you know, they would sell pieces of property. We talked about that, about how to create a whole new community, the things that they did. They listened to what Jesus, what the Holy Spirit told them to do about what they had. Nobody is forced. When people tell you you have to, you do what Scripture tells you to do. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. So there is this process of we're together a lot. We see one another. We see one another enough to get annoyed with one another. We learn conflict resolution. We learn how to care. So people are watching this. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. So the way they lived their life every day, how they behaved in Walmart, how they behaved at the gas station, what they did at school while they were in school, or what they did when they picked or dropped their kids off at school, what they did. I mean, did they, God's goodness was just present. Not me telling you that you're going to hell if you don't love Jesus. His goodness was present. People do need to understand the direness of this, but there is a thing that is a witness that's even stronger than that shocking knowledge that you're a supernatural being having a temporary physical experience and the decisions you make here open and close doors in the supernatural. All right. So God's goodness to everyone. There is this intriguing witness of just living your Christian life. And the Lord added daily to the community those who were being saved. People didn't go out and notch their belts saying, oh, got another one. Oh, got another one. I I witnessed to so many. Yeah, this whole process can get so distorted in the wrong hands. There is this healthy process of it happening in a community that's responsible, that is tactile, that is there. You. It's It just breaks my heart because we have dealt with families where a person in the family who is trying to operate in an ancient and ungodly patriarchal model and telling Mm -hmm. the family they can't come to a public church and they have to follow this stuff online and these kids don't have any fellowship and the 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 the, the mom is dying because of you know inside because she needs that that community i mean all that's abuse that is that is wrong there is this goodness of fellowship where there is this freedom you have to have other people who have authority talking into your life Mm You do. There is this beautiful thing of God's goodness that the Lord added to the community, those who were being saved. Robin, you and I and two other women, we we just had this great experience of being able to go to this conference in Denver, a theological conference, and sit there and geek out. And we're just there. We, We 
traveled two different ways and we got there and we met there and we were having a great time and just being and we had lunch together and we went to the Weird People store, which in our world, that means a co-op to get some organic food and stuff to make sure we had stuff in our room for the, the days we were there. And we just bring it downstairs and we're eating at one of the tables in the lobby and just and we happen to adopt two new friends and just visiting and sharing, you know, sharing because, hey, we have plenty. We never, praise God, we have plenty. We bought servings of this and you know, a whole container of chicken and let's all. And, okay, so that was that. And then later, the next day, one of those women were in a workshop with some of us that were in the same workshop. And I don't know what we were doing. We're just sitting in the back near the fan because I was hot. <laughs> and, and just, I don't know. I don't know what we were doing. I don't know if we were giggling over something or jesting about something that happened but she turned around and she just looked at us she said you guys are just weird you guys are just weird it's like oh we were too noisy sorry she goes no i don't cry you guys really like each other i could have fallen off my chair yeah it's like where my heart just aches for her it's like what is your life what wait a minute isn't this isn't this what acts two is talking about this idea of of being and learning these skills and this to me is just normal but it is not normal out there and i share that with our listening audience it's like if you don't have it as your normal you find ask the lord to lead you to a healthy community a healthy church yep. that has structure that is responsible to someone that has people speaking life into them and them speaking life you find that healthy church and you can tell because people don't force you or shame you into doing things because yep. if you're being shamed into doing things then it's not healthy right. so and find out what that is really like mm-hmm. and i am praying that for our new friend because That's what this is talking about. That is what happens when the Lord adds to the church daily. It's because they see this, and we are designed to thrive in this environment. Anyone who works with children will tell you that. That's the environment we're supposed to be creating. Not one that keeps track and measures people, but one that everybody can learn. Everybody gets to grow. And as long as we are there working on that together, everybody is welcome who is going to contribute that way. Not the ones who are going to sit there and make a checklist and tell people how rotten they are because they're not measuring up to Scripture. That doesn't work in this healthy community. That individual won't stay. They will end up going, and it will, of course, be the healthy community's fault because they can't accept responsibility for their own bad behavior. It happens all the time. It does. Such an immaturity. But when you get there, you're going to have... That experience where you're just places and people look at you. You're going to be in a and people, Why are you so happy? Mm-hmm. Oh, you're going to hate the answer. I know you're going to hate the answer, but it really is just Jesus and doing the things that are outlined in Scripture. So here, when we look at being saved, means what? This is the reason why. This is what we are saved. Yep, eternity is part of it, but this is just as much of a part of it. This invitation into community. There is... A supernatural experience of being a community in Christ. Don't know else how to explain it. Hebrews 10, 25 in closing says this. Do not neglect the gathering together as some are in the habit of doing. Don't neglect gathering together. you got to be together in order for this to happen. But encourage each other. And you need to do this even more as we see the end times approaching. Because this is going to be the witness that says, hey, wait a minute. You were designed for more than this. Thanks for listening in on this week's episode of Chew on This. We'd love to invite you. Please come join us at the Wednesday Night Church to enjoy this discussion live at Maranatha's Forest Lake Campus at 6.30 p.m. If you'd like to check out this week's resources, head on over to the website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night, and you're going to find a really fun, full archive to play around in. A parting thought. As we're all learning to put missional living into practice, let's remember its simplicity. Today, wherever we find ourselves, let's love God and love people. See you for the next Chew on this episode.